Pan 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 Psychast. Part two: Further analysis and discussion. So, Sulla, in the previous section, we focused on Avicenna's arguments for the existence of a necessary existent, but we didn't discuss any of God's other attributes besides simplicity. In your book, Necessary Existence and Monotheism, which is brilliant, by the way, you tease us by saying that all the attributes of God can somehow be drawn out of God as being necessary, but you don't tell us how. Allah is said to have at least ninety-nine names, from the King to the Avenger. Are these names the same as those found in other Abrahamic traditions? So, for example, is God omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnibenevolent? Thank you. I'm happy that you liked the book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but regarding the attributes of, I think we already talked about the uniqueness of God, the mm-hmm. simplicity of God, and with some simple moves, we can also show that God is not material mm-hmm. because every material thing. Is compound. Uh, right. It has matter and form. Mm. So, because God is simple, God cannot be material. Mm-hmm. And then Avicenna, through some not really simple moves, shows that everything that is immaterial is intelligible, and everything that is intelligible but is it's not substantiated in matter must be an intellect, something that can be thinking mm, right. um, okay. and so we have from these kind of moves the attribute of gods being a knowing agent gods mm-hmm. being wise and also from his perspective being good being perfect because god is necessary existent actually mm-hmm. from avicenna's perspective goodness is pure existence right and Evil is the absence of. Um, oh, it's like a privation. Yeah, exactly. Being privation. itself is good. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Being itself is a good, and God is the most perfect being. Therefore, God is the best being. Uh, Why does he think that being itself is good? Is it the sort of thing we see with the traditional theists in the Christian worldview? So we've got creatures moving towards their completeness, so towards. Goodness and to be complete is is to be good. We don't see them naturally being disposed towards their destruction. Like destruction isn't seen as the good, it's seen as the bad. From Avicenna's perspective, there cannot be something outside God which provides a motivation for doing anything for God. I mean, God doesn't create people just because creating people is good. Hmm. God himself is goodness. God himself is the whole meaning of goodness. Because in a sense, we understand the notion of goodness from understanding God, not vice versa. Right. Uh, God is the necessary existence and everything that God is, is good. Mm. So basically, the most perfect being is the best being. And the most perfect existent is the best existent. And because the necessary existence is the most perfect mm. version of things that can exist mm. is God is goodness. So one of the classical responses to this view that God is being itself and being itself is good, therefore we can attribute omnibenevolence to Allah, is the problem of hell, which according to most Islamic traditions, hell's a real place in which evildoers and non-believers are punished for eternity. And the Quran talks of, quote, garments of fire have been prepared for the unbelievers. Scalding water shall be poured upon their heads, melting their skins and that which is in their bellies. They shall be lashed with rods of iron. And if they're trying to escape, the angels drag them back again. All that, and if their bodies are burned away, quote, the Quran tells us, when their skins are burned away, we shall replace them with new ones so that it continue to feel the pain. Do you agree with this conception? of hell, Salah, and if you do or don't, do you think that conception of hell is a reasonable argument against Allah's omnibenevolence? 
to have a clear idea of the Islamic conception of hell, we have to discuss all of these, I mean, sentences about heaven and hell mm. in the scripture and also from the tradition of the hadith that we have in the Islamic tradition saying of the prophets about the interpretation of verses and these things. Mm. So we don't, without having all of these kind of, I mean, exegetical studies, we cannot uh, really say what is the exact Islamic conception of hell and heaven. But I can say that there are people who believe that eventually hell would be empty. And we can say that there are interpretations according to which mm. hell is nothing but some sort of incarnation of mm -hmm. our own action in mm -hmm. the afterlife. So it's not something that is, we are not punished by something that is not part of our ourselves. You'd make a fantastic politician. So uh, if, you, <laughs> if you have one of the uh, alternative careers. can I push you what, as to just what your intuitions, what your thoughts are? Do you have a... We have to understand the notion of heaven and hell. I think one of the best way to understand this problem is in the light of Ted Sider's puzzle for the hell. I don't know if you know right. about that puzzle, but the puzzle is that hell and heaven are two places that are extremely different. One mm. of them is extremely good. The other is extremely bad. And God decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Mm. And God decides based on which criteria one goes to heaven and one goes to hell. Mm. And then he says that, suppose that we order our people based on, for example, their being morally good and morally bad. Yeah. And then wherever we put the, I mean, threshold, the cutoff line, there's going to be some middle of the road cases that are just over or just yes, under. Yes, exactly. The line. There are people who are, from a moral point of view, very close to each other. Yeah. But one of them in one side and the other on the other side of the threshold cutoff line. So one of them would be in heaven and the other would be in yeah. hell. But it seems to be very intuitive that justice must be proportional. And yeah. so people that are very close to each other from a moral point of view, shouldn't be treated in a very extremely different mm. ways by God. Therefore, this traditional conception of heaven and hell yeah. in the Islamic tradition, in the Christian tradition, in, in all traditions who believe in these sort of binary conceptions of mm. heaven and hell must be rejected. Ah. And I agree in a very non-political way. No, that's great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, this conception must be rejected. Yeah. But we can still talk, and this is my own view about heaven and hell, that we can still talk about heaven and hell and consider them as vague notions. In the mm. same sense that good and bad are vague notions, heaven and hell themselves can be vague notions. What does it mean to be it a mean, vague notion? It in means terms that of there are hell? notions which come of degree. You know, when we right, say that okay. someone is a good person or someone is mm. a bad person, it doesn't mean that we have, I mean, cut off line from which we can distinguish, I mean, bad people from good people. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's obvious that there are people that with some confidence, we can say that they are good people. Yeah. And there are other people that we can say mm. that they are bad people. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are people that we cannot easily say whether or not they are good and bad. We can look at heaven and hell in the same way. When we say that someone will be in hell, it means that that person would be close to the other extreme that we usually refer to by the term hell. Mm. And when we say that someone will be in heaven, it means that this person would be closer to the other side. Mm -hmm. And this makes much more sense when we combine this view with the view that punishment and reward in the afterlife mm -hmm. is nothing but the true nature, hidden nature of our own action. Mm. Okay. So basically what we receive in the afterlife is not something additional, external, imposed to us by God. Mm -hmm. It's just the true nature of our actions that come back to us. Mm. And if we combine these two things, true nature of our actions, goodness and badness of them are vague. So hell and heaven would be vague as well. Mm. So that traditional conception must be rejected. But this conception that I just explained, I think it's compatible 
with the text of Quran as well, but it needs exegetical moves as well. Mm. I think you articulated that point really well, Salah, and it's really interesting um, for you to explain the nuances of your position. I think, though, it is worth saying that the very mainstream Muslim perspective is that one of the six beliefs for Sunni Muslims is the belief in Akira, right? The belief in life after death, that there is Jannah, there is paradise, there is Jahannam, there is hell. And some, many Muslims would take, you know, the Quran at its literal truth and says, if it says in that text that this judgment, this day of judgment will happen and you will be judged by Adul, by a just God, you will face either the judgment of reward or punishment. Can you just tell us from that kind of more traditional perspective, what do we have to do to get to Jannah? What do we need to do to get to heaven? Who's going to be saved? For this one, I think I have to, I mean, provide another political answer. <laughs> no, I, I don't know, to be honest. Yeah, we want no. a list. Uh, yeah. We want a list yeah. of yeah. all the people who are going to yeah. be saved. As, yeah. as, as long as we're all on the list, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's compatible with the text of the Quran mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. everyone who wants to be saved mm-hmm. by God and everyone who looks for truth and everyone who act based on what they actually know right. uh, will be saved. Mm. So of course, of- you know, there are some things that we should be added to this picture, some mm-hmm. subtle things. But the rough idea is that I think based on my own opinion, my mm. own understanding of the Islamic tradition, it's compatible with the text of the Quran that mm. everyone who actually does, I mean, his or her best to act based on what they really know, then they can be saved. To move you away from your own beliefs about Islam and and bring you into more comfortable ground or in terms of a more pure philosophy, let's say, the day of judgment involves me being assigned a new body, perhaps. So when I die now, Allah's going to resurrect me or give me a new body in the day of judgment. He's going to send me to, let's just say, paradise or hell or or this vague purgatory-like state, whatever it might be. I'm going to have my A body, right? So does that mean that I am my consciousness or my soul? Like, what does my identity consist in, in terms of providing a view of the afterlife within the tradition of Islam? Of course, you know, according to the literal meaning of the verses of the Quran, there will be a bodily resurrection after life. And we know, at least from some contemporary works in philosophy of religion, that this view can in principle be defended. It's not mm-hmm. as controversial as we thought 50 years, I mean, <laughs> ago, we thought uh, having any arguments. But there, we know that there are people who are, has actually provided some strong arguments in favor of this view. But for example, for Avicenna, from a purely philosophical point of view, mm-hmm. the bodily resurrection is impossible. Right. He says that it's almost impossible to provide any philosophical argument, but we accept this through revelation, through what we are told about by the prophet. He says we should accept it through revelation. Yes, okay. yeah. So he his view that, is that it's possible to have a bodily resurrection because it says it in divine he revelation. He says that philosophically we cannot make sense of this uh, resurrection. But through revelation, we cannot know that you know, there will be a bodily resurrection. You mentioned that lots of people have defended this view since, that Everson is wrong. Perhaps we can find a philosophical defense of a bodily resurrection. Was Actually, the- for example, in Al-Ghazali, you know, one of the three things that Avicenna was called kafir hmm. uh, by Al-Ghazali, a disbeliever or unbeliever, hmm. yeah. uh, was exactly this, the denial of the possibility of bodily resurrection. Right. Hmm. But Avicenna believes that, yes, if we restrict ourselves in a purely philosophical framework, we don't have any plausible argument in favor of bodily resurrection. But based on other philosophical arguments, we can accept the existence of God. We can accept the reliability of prophecy. Mm. And through these line of things, we have some sort of evidence that this must be possible, mm-hmm. uh, although we don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> so Avicen argued, as far as we know, that the mind and the body were distinct. And he creates probably one of his most famous, I guess, ideas that people may have heard of, which is the floating man thought experiment. And he uses this to argue for the existence and self-awareness of the soul. So can you tell us, Salah, what the floating man thought experiment is that we find in the Book of Healing? Discuss this argument not only in that book, but also in uh, many other places. Mm-hmm. This argument was one of uh, his favorite arguments, Mm. but the exact conclusion of this 
argument is not clear. The argument goes like this, that imagine that you or someone else is created suddenly out of thin air. It means that you don't feel, for example, the weight of your body. You don't feel, for example, your skin. You are blind, so you don't have any sensory experience. You don't have any memory of the past. So basically, you don't have any access to the external world. And you are like a body who cannot touch itself, flying or floating in the air. Then he asked us whether or not you know that you exist. Mm. Are we aware of the existence of ourself? Uh, so it seems the answer to this question is positive. Even if I don't know anything about the external world, even if I don't have any information about my body, even mm. if I don't feel my body, we can still say that we exist. We have some sort of self-awareness. So would it be fair then to say that, okay, so we, we strip away all of the empirical sense data, we can't see, we can't taste, we can't touch. Exactly. But there is still this self-awareness. Would it be fair to characterize Avicenna's view then that it's dualistic, that there's mind stuff and physical stuff working together? Yeah, the argument can be continued like this. We are aware of ourselves, but we are not aware of our body. Mm. So the body and self must be distinct things. Because if body and self are one and the same thing, mm -hmm. the awareness of one of them must be the awareness of the other. Of course, there is a very simple objection here that you might say that, for example, we know about Hesperus and we know about Phosphorus, but mm. we don't know that they are one and the same thing, mm -hmm. but actually they are one and the same thing. The answer from an Avicennian perspective could be something like this. This is true that you are aware of, for example, Hesperus, and Hesperus is Phosphorus, but you are not aware of the second one. But your awareness of Hesperus is not self-awareness. Mm -hmm. mm. When you are aware of yourself, you cannot be ignorant of something that is identical to yourself. Because... Right. It's possible to have knowledge of something from a third person perspective mm -hmm. without knowing that it is actually identical with something else, you mm -hmm. know? But from the first person perspective, we cannot have knowledge of something without having knowledge of anything that is identical to it. So okay. the big difference that we have here is the first person perspective that we have here. So basically, the idea is kind of dualistic, but... At the same time, I have to say that there are people in the Islamic tradition whose conception of the mind-body problem is different. They believe in ideas which can be labeled as panpsychist, for example. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, the body and mind are not two substantially distinct things. They are not two strictly distinct substances, mm. but they are just two aspects of the same reality that we have in the world. Let us pause for a wee jiffy to say a quick thank you to the show's patrons for making this episode possible. In particular, a very special thank you to the man who hates the third pillar of Islam. It's Joe Richardson, our resident jinn, and a particularly friendly one at that. It's Mr. Jimmy Kasperson. Hurrying to eat before sunrise, it's Justin Scurry. Up to his knees when he performs voodoo, he may not be doing it right, it's Mr. Chris Ford. She's really into stealing. Good thing she doesn't live in Saudi Arabia, it's Leslie Robson Foster. Still small enough to receive gifts on Eid, it's Carter Young. During Ramadan, you will never catch him fasting, not even on water, it's Dan Posh. He was on the front lines during the Battle of Badr with his bow and arrow, it's Zarchery Arnold. He likes to follow in the example of the Prophet Muhammad, but all this praying drives him round the bend. It's Matt Carrera. Listening to the revelations of the prophets makes his hair stand on end. It's neural surge. He believes that Sunni and Shia Muslims will one day unite in their love of cricket. It's Anthony Walsh. Counting her bad deeds makes her stomach turn. It's Elijah Uez. And last but not least... He receives revelations of corporate scams. He builds communities in the desert of a corporate wasteland. And the angel Jibril himself would never ask him to read, for he has read every book that ever has and will be written. It's our most gracious, 
Jim. Claire. If you're enjoying the show and you want to help us build a new community of the pure of heart, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. I put my sunglasses on because they're prescription, not because I'm, <laughs> I need to read a quotation, not because I'm <laughs> trying to look super cool for the, the question I'm about to ask. Although I think this is one of the ones I was most excited to ask you, Salah, before doing the interview. Because when, when we spoke to William Lane Craig, he spoke quite damningly of the type of love that Muslims attribute to Allah. And mm. he compares the love of the Christian God with the God of Islam. And he tells us that, and I'll give the quotation here. He said, it's like night and day. The New Testament, Jesus says, God so loved the world. And that means that the unbelieving world, he gives his only son to them too. On the other hand, like a drumbeat through the Quran, he says, God does not love sinners. God does not love unbelievers. God does not love the hard-necked. God is an enemy to unbelievers. And he says, it struck me so forcefully that according to the Quran, God does not love precisely those people that Jesus says God loves so much that he gave his only son for them. I say this publicly in my dialogues and debates with Muslim theologians. I think that Islam has a morally defective concept of God. God, according to Islam, is not all loving. He only loves those who love him first. How do you respond to someone who says that this God you believe in, his love is conditional? I can't disagree more. <laughs> you know, I agree that love is not as central to Islam as Christianity. But I think those readings of the Quranic verses are not really uh, accurate. Right, and okay. if you want to consider the Islamic view about whether or not God actually loves people, sinful people or not, we have to consider all verses in which the text of the Quran talks about God's relation with people. And if we consider all of them all together, I think we can reach a completely different view. Your response simply put would be, I can interpret the Quran differently, therefore God's love isn't the way you describe it. But you said at the start there that God's love isn't as central in Islam as it is Christianity. What did you mean by that? You can correct me if I'm wrong, but if you ask, for example, a Christian, what's the most, I mean, central attribute of God? Yeah. The answer would be something like uh, love, you know, yeah. God is loving. But I think in the Quran, I think the m most central attribute of God is not love. Okay. I think it's not really easy to say that this, for example, a specific attribute in the Islamic context is more pivotal, more central than, for example, the other attribute. Mm. But there are a group of attributes that all of them must be considered together. For example, at the same time that God is love, but God is also justice, you know? Right. Mm. And when we combine these two things together, mm. then we might have a different view of the correct treatment that God can have with people, you know? Mm. The correct attitude that divinely being can have towards people. So justice, power, love, all of them, you know, together must be considered together at the same time. If right. we just focus on one of them, we can have misleading views about the Islamic belief. One of the strongest reasons to not be a theist, someone who doesn't believe in God, is the argument from evil. If Allah is beneficent, if he's powerful, omniscient, knows about evil occurring, then why doesn't he intervene? Is there a common Muslim solution to the problem of evil? I don't think that there is a common Muslim solution that everyone is happy with. Mm. I said that love is not as central to Islam as Christianity. Mm. Mm. And I think the problem of evil is a serious problem for Christianity because love is very central mm. to Christianity yeah. because God is love, you know? Mm. And if God is love, why we see all of these bad things in the world mm. that are apparently not really compatible with God's being love? So first of all, I think this problem is probably more challenging for a Christian than a Muslim mm -hmm. because the existence of evil in the world is in a very obvious way incompatible with the description of God that we have, for example, in the Bible, you know? Yeah. But in the Quran, as I said, you know, we have a very complex picture of God in which love, justice, you know, punishment, reward, mm. all of these things can work together. 
So sometimes, for example, evil is a punishment and punishment is just because God is just, you know. But having said that, mm -hmm. even if we consider the problem from a purely, I mean, classic point of view in which, for example, the problem of evil is a problem for belief in theism, I can say that there are different views, different solutions. Mm. Avicenna's solution is that evil is a privation. Of course, yeah. And we have also solutions solutions based on TODC mm. uh, and free will mm. and these things. And also something that I am inclined to is that actually we don't really know <laughs> a skeptical view about mm. the problem of evil. Like uh, a skeptical theist? Yeah, exactly, sort of exactly. We should be very careful because yeah. uh, I don't believe that we can apply this skeptical approach to every problem that we have about yeah, theism, course, you know, yeah. because, you know, for example, if we are not enough careful, then every problem that we have, one might say that, okay, why not we accept uh, just some sort of uh, skepticism about this problem, you mm -hmm. know? We don't know, but God must have uh, some reason for this, you know? We can't understand, but God must have some uh, reason for that. I don't believe in such a trivial approach, which I believe doesn't make sense very much. But mm. in this specific problem, the problem of evil, having all of those, I mean, uh, reservations that I said, mm. all of those different maneuvers that one can make, I think we can believe in some sort of skepticism here. So before we take a couple of listener questions, I've always been perplexed or interested in this question of, why pray in a particular direction? And one of the papers in this special edition of Religious Studies that you edit discusses this problem. So if I think that Allah is present, is everywhere, then it shouldn't matter in which direction I pray. You might think that the whole world is divine if Allah is everywhere. But at the same time, whether it was Jerusalem in the first instance and now Mecca, why would I pray metaphysically speaking, towards a quote-unquote divine place. If you say Mecca is a divine place, but at the same time you go, well, Allah's sort of everywhere, so everywhere is a divine place. So therefore it wouldn't make sense. Yes, I think there is, there is kind of fallacy here in this argument. If we pray to a specific direction, mm -hmm. in that direction we must find something divine. Right. But the other way around does not hold. So it doesn't mean that everywhere, that every direction in which we find something divine, we can pray in that direction. For example, the direction of our prayer must be towards God, but it must have some other, for example, things as well. And that's why I say that even if we accept that God is omnipresent, mm -hmm. so all directions are in a sense divine, each direction we can find God, it doesn't mean that we are allowed to pray in every direction mm. because it might be the case that we have some other, I mean, additional factors which are necessary for prayer. One of them is the presence of God. The other must can be something like this, that God asks us to do prayer in this direction right. to give us a common label, for example, yeah. common behavior, common mm -hmm. ritual, you know, mm -hmm. to make us united, you know, uh, to make yeah. a union. I uh, thought you might say us. It, yeah. it is quite obvious. I just wondered if they had any particular metaphysical significance outside of some revelation or instruction by but you I say, don't want to say that this is uh, you know for sure the reason that God had for this, you know. Mm. I want to say that there can be things, mm. and this can be one of those things. It may turn out that God's reason for asking us to do prayer in this direction is something completely different. But my answer to the question you ask is that it seems that we cannot simply say that because every direction is divine, then we are allowed to pray in every direction if you understand prayer in the specific Islamic sense of Salat. Mm -hmm. So a couple of listener questions as we come towards the end of our discussion. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question for Salat. If you've got a question for one of our future guests, then head over to the thepansycast.com. A link is in the description. Have you got one there that tickles your fancy, Mr. Marley? Sure. So we'll start off with Ishmael Mohammed Adnan, who's from Bangladesh. And he asks, Allah, what do you think of arguing that Islamic theology is true because it's in line with our intuition in light of Descartes? 
Also, how can God create without antecedent matter? Can we perceive God in this life? Nice, easy one there in 30 seconds. Um, any response for our friend uh, Adnan? Difficult questions, but uh, for example, about creation, the theological system that, for example, Avicenna defends is not creation out of nothing. Mm. So basically, we don't have this problem in, for example, an Avicennian theological system. Regarding that, uh, can we perceive God in this life? I think yes, but we should be careful about the meaning of perception here, perceiving mm. uh, here. Mm. But overall, as I said in the beginning of this interview, I find William Alston's of the reliability of religious experience mm. very plausible in his mm -hmm. book, Perceiving God. Mm. He actually defends the reliability of experiences that we usually describe as perceiving God in our life. And based on very similar reasons, I think this approach is completely defensible. Mm. Lovely answer to Adnan's question. Our next question comes from Furhwan Ali from Pakistan. And They ask, what do you think about linguistic, strictly no theology or theosophy approach towards the Quran, mostly assumed by people relating to the, I apologize for the pronunciation of this word, is Lahai school of thought, for example, Javed Ahmed Gamidi? I think literalism in the history of Islamic thought has a very long, very rich background, but I don't find literalism very plausible. Mm. First of all, because there are verses in the Quran that if we take them in the literal sense, mm. they must accept that they are at least in a sense contradictory. Mm. So without accepting some sort of contradictory theological system that some people are happy to accept, mm -hmm. without accepting such a contradictory system that I'm not happy with. Mm. I think we don't have any other way but to interpret some verses of Quran. Mm. On the other hand, there are places in the Quran that the text itself says that these are examples. For example, about Jannah, some of these descriptions that are very popular in social media are coming from verses before which the text itself says that these are some examples. So, Masalul Jannah, it means that Jannah looks like something similar to this, but it mm. doesn't mean that Jannah mm. is exactly That's this nice. one. The heaven is exactly this one. So, in some verses, Quran itself says that these are not just literally true things that mm. you can see, for example, in the afterlife. Let me ask you a final question because I, from a listener, because I think, I wonder if your answer is going to be similar for this one then. So, Gray Greenford from the UK asks, This is a genuine question and not a criticism. Please don't ignore. Don't worry, Faye, we're not ignoring you. The role of women in Islam is a big media story. Do you think that Islam has a bigger problem with women than those of the other religions like Christianity? Why and does Islam talk about men being superior to women and men being gifted with virgins in heaven? I don't think that Islam has a bigger problem, but there are interpretations of uh, Islam mm -hmm in which, I mean, the view of women is worse than the view of women in other religions. Mm, right. uh, so there are interpretations that can give us this impression. Mm. But I don't think that those interpretations are plausible. So I think mm. not only about this problem about women, but I think this is the general approach that I think the, is the most plausible. If something, if we interpret something that is not really compatible with our reason, with mm -hmm. our uh, rational belief, then that cannot be religious right. belief. It cannot be part of an acceptable theological system. Mm -hmm. uh, around a concluding remarks then, Ollie, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Well, firstly, I just want to thank you so much, Salah, for joining us today for an absolutely fascinating discussion about philosophy of religion, about Islam. I've learned loads, so I'm sure our audience is going to be absolutely pleased with the interview. I want to mention a couple of things, really. I really appreciate, you know, at the start of our interview, our interview, you talked about your influences in terms of why you got interested in philosophy, and you talked about your religious upbringing, you talked about the focus on critical thinking. And I actually think that even though you might find this a little bit cheesy, I think yourself and Avicenna actually have quite a lot in common. <laughs> I think when we really do a lot of service to Avicenna was a very controversial thinker. He was, <laughs> one of my year nines the other day referred, referred to him as a bad boy, which I thought was quite funny because he kind of didn't necessarily care what the dogma of the time was. Mm -hmm. He was really interested in his own ideas and his own thinking and not being restricted by his religious faith. But 
using it as a starting point and then seeing where he ended up. And I think your thinking and what you've explained to us today has been sophisticated. It's been nuanced. You've really stressed that Islam is a religion like any other on the planet that has multiple levels of nuance and understanding. And I think that really flies in the face of the very common media perception of Islam, which is it's an incredibly dogmatic, sometimes backward looking religion with no nuance and no intellectual history. And all these wonderful philosophical ideas we've discussed today that come from Avicenna and the Islamic Golden Age and have continued until the, the present day, I think you've really done justice in presenting those in a really thoughtful, mature, sensible, reasoned, critical and philosophical way. So thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight to, to listen to you explain those ideas so well. Thank you so much. It was great. I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you. I'd like to echo both of your remarks. So I think I like what you say about you're very similar to our center in your eyes. So we said you're a big fan of them, but quite often when we're asking for your views during the interview, you go, well, Avicenna would say it's like <laughs> having Avicenna in the room. And it's, I, uh, I don't think that all of Avicenna's views are true and correct, mm -hmm. but I think there are lots of interesting insights in Avicenna's works that we can still use. We can borrow those ideas and insights from Avicenna to contribute to ongoing debates and discussions in contemporary philosophy. You make that really clear in your book, which again, and I emphasize Ollie's point from earlier, which is brilliant. And you say, we can extract these ideas and you do a great job of signposting. Well, here I'm taking a little bit of liberty, but not so much. And here's why I'm doing it and how I'm doing it. So you're really bringing him into the 21st century philosophy of religion. And as we spoke about right at the beginning, philosophy of religion is suffering with a diversity problem and brilliant projects like the Global Philosophy of Religion Project and hopefully interviews like we've had with you today are going to broaden that. And it certainly will for my own work. I mean, we've done 110 episodes, nothing on Islam. Mm. And you know, I do a lot of philosophy of religion. I rarely do anything on Islam. And mm. when me and Ollie go, Ollie, we go to the pub and Ollie tells me loads <laughs> of things about Islam. <laughs> and I think I'm going to go away and actually do some research. And it was great to have the opportunity to do that in prep for this interview. But in terms of Avicenna, just a final note, I think a lot of listeners will be here thinking, oh, that's just Descartes, or that's just Leibniz, or that's just Aquinas. Yeah. And I think because of where Avicenna is in the history of philosophy, it's great to see. Actually, no, this has its roots in this deep and interesting and progressive and original Islamic thought with the work of Avicenna. So I've really to enjoyed that. To be honest, that. I don't know any person who actually read Avicenna and thinks he is not really great. <laughs> you know? <laughs> we're, we're no are, yeah, right, yeah, I think everyone who reads Avicenna they can easily see that there are lots of brilliant ideas there, mm. regardless of whether or not you agree with him. Mm. So something you won't think is really great is our final installment, Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Pop 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 Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy Quiz. So we're playing Mohammed Salah Zarapur, Mohammed Salah Zarapur. So we've got quotes from a Muhammad, we've got quotes from a Salah, we've got quotes from a Zupor, and quotes from Al Muhammad Salah Zupor. So your quotes from Muhammad are going to be quotes from Muhammad Ali, Okay. so the American professional boxer and activist, widely considered to be the heavyweight boxer of all time. You've got quotes from a Salah, so Muhammad Salah, the beloved Egyptian and Liverpool professional footballer who Salah was telling us, gets <laughs> yeah. mistaken. you get mistaken for him quite yes, a lot yeah. in your days to life. We've got quotes from Zupor man, Superman. Oh, come on, I did. It's so hard. Can you think of someone you could give quotes for? Probably not. No, so no, no, there's, yeah. there's some politicians, but they'd say things yeah. which are very politicians, yeah. so it's hard to find. So you've got quotes from Clark Superman. Joseph Kent, investigative journalist and vigilante. And you've got quotes from none other than Mohammed Salah Zupor, so lecturer in philosophy at the University of Manchester. So we're going to have quotes from. So so I so this, hear, is, this is for me more than anything. Yeah. So we're going to have quotes from. Muhammad. Muhammad Ali. So I want to hear Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. We're going to have quotes from Superman, quotes from Muhammad Salah, the footballer, or quotes from Salah, our lovely philosopher here. Yeah, that's his finger <laughs> cool. first. So just, just check it. Just shout out yeah. which one you <laughs> think cool. that works. Okay, go on. Then. If they can make penicillin out of mouldy bread, they can sure make something out of you. Muhammad Salah, the footballer? No, it's no. not. Muhammad, <laughs> do, any idea for that one, Salah? Superman. <laughs> it's not Superman. You've got two other people. We're not do. We can't have a limitation. Yeah, the politician. Yet. Is there a poor the politician? Yeah. There's no politician no, no. there, but that was Muhammad Ali. Really? <laughs> oh, there's one nil to me. I'm going to join in if you What's don't the context get that. That's a very bizarre question. Parents and house bidders partially contribute to the origination of children and houses. Muhammad Salah, the footballer. No, I'm going to stick with this one. Damn it. The politician. <laughs> there's no. It goes Muhammad Ali, the boxer. 
Mohamed Salah the footballer, Clark Kent, or you? Oh, okay. So... Boxer, footballer, Superman, or you? <laughs> footballer. It's not foot- that was you. That was in your book. Really? was it? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you said that. When? <laughs> in your book, which we spoke about. <laughs> I myself don't want to drink, and I don't want to try. Clark Kent? It's not Clark Kent. Any idea? Salah. The footballer? Yeah, the footballer. The footballer. Yeah, nice. One nil against yeah. someone. <laughs> got a point eventually. <laughs> Float like a butterfly, sting like That's a bee. That's Muhammad Ali. That's one yeah, all. Yeah. Now we're rolling. My guess is that many theologians are reluctant to defend negative theology just because they don't like being called negative theologians. Oh, that's got to be you. <laughs> Did you know, know that was you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, this one I knew. <laughs> There's a shadow inside of all of us, but that doesn't mean you need to embrace it. You decide who you really are. That's Superman. That's Superman. Yeah. You cannot score 10 goals from 10 shots. That's impossible. It's got to be Mohamed Salah. I'm trying that Salah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> If my mind can conceive of it, if my heart can believe it, then I can achieve it. That's Muhammad Ali, definitely. Muhammad Ali, yeah. Yeah. storming ahead now at 4-1. Zoom, ergo sum. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I have no idea. Zoom, ergo sum. Zoom, ergo sum? Yeah, me. <laughs> <laughs> just as all vengeance, it just depends whose side you're on. Uh, That's Superman? <laughs> Superman. And finally, it's just a job. Grass grows, birds fly, waves pound the sand. I beat people up. <laughs> Muhammad Ali. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it was interesting. If you've enjoyed this episode, then you can find links to all the Salah's work, including his brilliant book on necessary existence and monotheism on our website, as well as on his website, a link to which is in the iTunes description. Last but not least, thank you again to all of our wonderful patrons for supporting the show. Just a quick note, Old School Pan Psycast returns in two weeks' time when me, Ollie, and Mr. Andrew Horton Woo-hoo. resurrected <laughs> from the dead. Body and soul. <laughs> Body and soul. Same person as before. We'll be discussing the work of Hannah Arendt. A final thank you to the Global Philosophy of Religion Project at the University of Birmingham, funded by the John Templeton Foundation and led by Professor Eugene Nagasawa. To find out more about the project, you can go to global-philosophy.org or hit the link in the iTunes description. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, soothing voices of Mr. Ali Mali. Thank you for listening. Dr. Mohamed Salah Zarpour. Thank you so much. And me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Salah. Thank you. (laughs) 